we know that uh, almost 50%, 48% of the people uh, die suddenly. Uh, uh, that is what uh, the, the data is. So sudden cardiac death is a very important uh, uh, topic which we should discuss. Um, I think we have a, a panel of experts. Uh, uh, the, so without much uh, uh, delay, we will go directly to the topic. Um, back to uh, Dr. Sanjay uh, to start the program. Thank you, Dr. Hari. Uh, today is going to be a case-based discussion and we'll possibly, after the few uh, dedicated lectures from the, uh, the stalwarts, first Dr. Sandeep Seth is going to discuss about the magnitude of the problem of sudden cardiac death in heart failure scenario. As Dr. Hari was saying, it's menacing. Thereafter, uh, we would have Dr. Balbir Singh to talk about the devices in heart, as the reduction of sudden cardiac death syndromes. And this would be the knowns and the unknowns. And thereafter, the latest advances in the pharmacotherapy by Dr. Abraham Oman. Um, I'll invite now Dr. Sandeep Seth. Nobody needs any um, introduction from his side because he's a stalwart. Uh, and he'll talk on the magnitude of problem of a sudden cardiac death in heart failure syndromes. Dr. Sandeep Seth, please. Thank you, Sanjay. Thank you, Dr. Hari. So we'll just get the slides rolling and we'll start. So sudden cardiac death is a major problem that we face in heart failure. If we start by looking at the magnitude of the problem, it's a major killer all around the world. And if you start by looking at the data from the US and Europe, about 3.5 to 4 lakh deaths per annum occur because of sudden cardiac death, which comes to about a annual risk of about one per thousand population. And that is responsible for about 50 to 50% 50 of the deaths of coronary artery disease. That's the data from the West. What about India? We don't have much data, but this is a very highly quoted study. This is data from uh, Dr. Raju. About 10% of the deaths which occur in India are because of sudden cardiac death. Like for all other diseases in India, most of these patients are about five to 10 years younger than the Western population. This is another study that we have found from India. If you look at the use of uh, ICDs for prevention of uh, sudden cardiac death, about half the ICDs are used for primary prophylaxis, half of them are used for secondary prophylaxis. And if you look at the causes for which the ICDs are used, so the commonest etiology for which the ICDs are used for prevention, so the commonest cause is coronary artery disease, that is about 58%. And the second commonest cause for which ICDs are indicated are dilated cardiomyopathy. So that's the kind of data that we have. And again, majority of the patients for which the ICDs are given are NYHA class two. And this will be relevant to what I'm gonna talk subsequently. Now, this is a very important slide. Now, it would generally be thought that uh, you should think of which patients are at high risk for sudden cardiac death and you should focus on those patients. But if you look at who are the patients who are actually succumbing to sudden cardiac death, the majority of the patients who are dying of sudden cardiac death, most of those patients actually have very few risk factors. So the majority of patients who die actually ha don't have all these risk factors. Though on the other hand, it's also true that if you have any of these risk factors, that means if you have a low ejection fraction, if you already survived a hemodynamically unstable VT or if you have high risk markers of arrhythmia or you have a prolonged QT or if you're in a post myocardial infarction situation, then you automatically fall in a high risk group and then the incidence of uh, SCD will become 10 to 20% versus if you have no risk factor, then the incidence of 
sun cut it, this is very low. Then, coming to what is the commonest rhythm found at the time of SCT, the commonest rhythm, as you very well know, is ventricular tachycardia. So that is the focus of what you're trying to prevent. The other, other rhythm disturbances are relatively less common. Looking at some of the predictors for uh, sun cardiac death, is ejection fraction so simple to use? First of all, of course, it is true that if you have a low ejection fraction, you're more prone to developing sudden cardiac death. But if you look at the range of ejection fraction, as the ejection fall, fraction falls below 30%, the total incidence and the prevalence of death increases. But if you look at the prevalence and incidence of death and the breakup of death, it's the non-sudden death which is also increasing. So the patients are dying, but they're also dying because of non-sudden death causes. So they're dying of heart failure also, and not all of it is sudden cardiac death. So if you have to try and prevent sudden cardiac death, your opportunity is in those patients of heart failure, but where the ejection fraction is somewhat more than 30%, which means that if you have to focus on focus your energies and your finances, you have to focus more on the patients who are basically NYHA class 2 and early NYHA class 3, not on the NYHA class 4, because these patients are anyway going to die. So putting all your money into an ICD is not really going to benefit the patient or be financially viable. So if ejection fraction is not such a very important predictor of uh, sudden cardiac, what are the other predictors? A very important predictor of sudden cardiac death, which is gaining prominence, is uh, MRI. So if you find enhancement of on MRI suggesting a scar, edema, or fibrosis, it has been found that these are very important predictors of sudden cardiac death. Another important marker is the detection of uh, ad adrenergic receptors. And using an iodine 1 to 3 MIBG scan, you can pick up these mar markers. And if you have an abnormal scan, it is a predictor of sudden cardiac death. So now if you look at the prevention of sudden cardiac death, has, has the prevalence and incidence been static over the past year? If you, if you look at data from 1995 to about 2010, 2011, the numbers have been falling. From 1995 to 2000, what has been happening? Initially, beta blockers were introduced for the management of heart failure, vasodilators were introduced. Now, RNA has come into the picture. So basically, the treatment of heart failure has been improving. And with the improvement of heart failure management, the prevalence and incidence of heart failure management has been coming down. So treatment of heart failure reduces the incidence and prevalence of sudden cardiac death. So in other words, it's not just the ICD which can prevent sudden cardiac death. Drug therapy, drug therapy, especially drugs like vasodilators, drug therapy like beta blockers, drug therapy like the RNA group of drugs will definitely play a major role in reducing the incidence of sudden cardiac death. We cannot, of course, discount ICDs. So let's start with the guidelines. What are the guidelines? Guidelines for secondary prevention. If a patient has survived an episode of sudden cardiac death, the guidelines are very clear. An ICD is indicated. It's a class one indication with level of evidence A. But you have to understand that these patients should be fit enough to be expected to survive more than one year after an ICD implant. And they should not have any reversible cause. And they should not be having a recent MI. That means they should be more than 48 hours after a myocardial infarction. So survivor of hemodynamically unstable ventricular arrhythmia, more than one year expected survival, no reversible cause, and beyond 48 hours of a myocardial infarction. Very clear, simple, straightforward guidelines. That's ESC, Heart Failure Guidelines 2021. Just to get an idea of how these guidelines are gone, just taken on one study, the CASH study, uh, antiarrhythmic amidron versus metaprol versus the ID, I, ICD. And over the initial five years and then over 10, 10 years, the ICD was clearly superior to drug therapy, whether a beta blocker or antiarrhythmic drug in showing reduction in the occurrence of uh, sudden cardiac death and overall mortality benefit. Though the mortality benefit 
did seem to average out over a follow-up of 10 years. And if you do a meta-analysis of all the secondary prevention trials, clearly ICD scores over all drugs, including Omitron. So for secondary prevention, there is absolutely no doubt. And this gives you an idea of the kind of number of deaths that are occurring. Now, if you look at this meta-analysis in more detail, what is important is that most of the benefit is coming in patients who have a low ejection fraction. So even in secondary prevention, if your ejection fraction is normal versus the ejection fraction low, a low ejection fraction is a clear indicator of high risk. Now, secondary prevention is relatively easy to manage because you've clearly already come into a high risk category. Primary prevention is different. Here, if you have a low ejection fraction of a less than 35%, you have post MI more than 40 days, and you had at least three months of optimal medical therapy, then uh, ICD is clearly a class one indication. But again, confusion comes in because you have the Danish trial. The Danish trial was a trial in which patients with non ischemic heart failure were given ICD. These are patients who were relatively sick. They had a high BNP. Majority of patients were class two, class three, and they were fairly well managed patients. So, majority of these patients were on an ACE inhibitor or a, and a beta blocker. Half of the patients had a CRT. So, this is a usual kind of patient that you would see who, whom you would say are well managed patients. And look at the results. Now, you know that these are sick patients because over the period of follow up of, for the next five years, mortality was about 20%. That is the burden of disease. The, the, the death from any cause was about 20% in both the groups, the ICD group and the control group. The sudden cardiac death was about 4% in the ICD group was about 8%. So there's a decrease in the sudden cardiac death, but overall the mortality is the same. And overall, there is actually no significant disease, no, no significant reduction in the overall mortality. So basically the Danish st study showed that in patients with non-ischemic heart failure, ICD may not always be beneficial. But if you combine all the studies which were done for primary prevention and do a meta-analysis, overall there has been benefit and in showing mortality benefit in reducing overall death. So for primary prevention, clearly the ICD is beneficial. Now, what is also true is that if the patient is class four, ICD it has a class three recommendation, which is which means that they, they should not be given an ICD unless here also is a caveat that unless they are being planned for a CRT also, or where the LV function might improve, or they are being planned for an assist device or a cardiac transplantation. So you expect that the ICD will prolong their survival or bridge them to an assist device or a transplantation. So just to summarize my talk, if you have a patient with severe heart failure, the heart failure itself puts them, puts them at risk. So which of the patients will be at high risk for SCD? If they have an ejection fraction below 35%, they are at risk for a SCD. Now, if they have contraindications to IC, they are very frail, they are very old, they have severe infection, then you have to think twice before considering them for ICD. Infections can be controlled, but very old patients, frail patients should be very carefully considered for ICD. Not many of them will actually be suitable for ICD. If they have a very low ejection fraction, again, if they have abnormal kidney or liver function, again, you should not think of them for ICD. Then you should never forget that there are lots of drugs available, more drugs are coming on the horizon, which can actually reduce the risk for SCD. So those drugs should be given optimal doses before you consider this high risk group for ICD. After that, if they've had a synco, which is the hemodynamically unstable VT, then automatically become the secondary prevention group where there is not much of confusion. But if they not had a synco, that means a primary prevention group, then you could perhaps, even if the ejection fraction is relatively low, think of other parameters like looking, doing an MRI or doing an MIBG scan or doing a halter, maybe using other methods to re-stratify these patients. So to conclude, 
Now, we know that the number of patients with heart failure are increasing along with the, the patients who are at the absolute number of patients at risk for SCD are increasing, though the percentage might be decreasing because we have better drugs for the management of heart failure. It's not just enough to measure the ejection fraction because that doesn't seem to alone predict the risk of SCD. There are other markers which are being gradually tested. Maybe in the future, we'll have a combination or a battery of tests which can better predict SCD. Drugs, as we'll see in the rest of the symposium, have a clear role in reducing the risk of SCD. So obviously, a very clear role of ICD, as Dr. Balbir will talk subsequently, in preventing SCD. Secondly, prevention is very clear. Primary prevention, patients have to be chosen very carefully to give them a very long-term survival. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sandeep. It's wonderful disposition of the fact that, uh, and very precise, that it's a big menacing problem having certain cardiac death problem with heart failure. And uh, the fact is that the worse the heart failure, the higher the risk of having certain cardiac death. And also, as you very rightly said, the heart failure management, the pharmacological management has substantially improved the outcome of certain cardiac death over the last 20 years, as much as a 44% reduction in the relative risk of certain cardiac death just by proper heart failure management. Um, I would now invite Dr. Balbir Singh. Uh, he would be talking on the role of uh, devices in certain cardiac death prevention. We know certain things and we do not know a lot of things. And he'll be advising us on, on those lines. Dr. Balbi. Dr. Sanjay, can you see my slides? Yes, we can see. <laughs> Thank you very much for this invitation. And uh, Sandeep has made my job a little easier explaining what uh, ICD means, but uh, there is still a lot of confusion about the role in uh, primary prevention. Secondary prevention, nobody um, blinks an eyelid, but by primary prevention all over the world creates some kind of a confusion as to what is the real nature of this. Um, so first question is who is at risk? All of us want to prevent sudden death. All of us know it is catastrophic to have a sudden death. All of us also know that all maximum deaths happen due to sudden death in cardiac death. So all this is known. But what is not clear is who is at risk. Are we wasting devices on some patients? Are we overdoing it? Are we, not, are we losing a lot of patients with sudden death whom we should have implanted a device and we didn't? So this dilemma has been a big cause of concern. And a lot of people's. Dr. Belbir, sorry to interrupt. There is, can you increase your volume a little bit? Yeah, I'll speak. To the... Now, can you hear me more better? Can you hear yeah. me better? Yeah, now? Yeah, slightly better. Okay, so this is putting many trials together. The CSF stat, Jessica, Salt, Well Health, all very famous trials. You can look at total mortality and the sudden death mortality in these trials. It is sizable. So total mortality and sudden death accounts for almost half of the deaths in these big trials. So it's a big problem, a big menace in heart failure. And the worst is the less symptomatic a patient, higher is the sudden death mortality. As you can see, uh, class two patients have 64% as deaths. So that is the worst thing. The patient is not that symptomatic and he, may not be that keen to get an ICD because he'll say, I don't have much symptoms. A class four patient is very keen to receive a ICD while he's the least likely to benefit. So this is the other dilemma that we have at our uh, point. So in people who had an MI, sudden death occurs four times the rate of general population. So one thing is clear that the post MI patients are at a big risk of sudden death. So if we put down all the risk factors we, uh, for primary prevention, we, we know reduced ejection fraction, prior MI, uh, heart failure, they are risk factors. What about others? Now, there is no clear understanding. We did a beautiful trial, Improve SCA. I will discuss briefly that trial. We do not have good understanding as to what uh, other patients could benefit from, uh, who should be 
the more beneficial patients. Let's look at some key primary prevention trials, MADIT, MUST, MADIT2, SCADEFT, Definitive and then Danish. So I will briefly discuss on Danish because this has produced a lot of controversy. Still, there is no answer. If you look at the inclusion criteria in these trials, they all these trials showed benefit in that use of ICD except Danish trial, which also will be discussed. The inclusion criteria, some have used ejection fraction 30%, some 35%, some 40%. So that means there is no clarity on ejection fraction. Some have used additional risk factors such as non-sustained VT, inducible VT on EPA. So one thing which is emerging, PVCs, non-sustained VT are risk markers in presence of poor ejection fraction. So you have two patients. One patient has, let's say, an ejection fraction of 38%. Another one has 30%. Uh, one has a lot of PVCs, some non-sustained VT. He clearly is at high risk. So the 38%, he has non-sustained VT, PVCs. He is a higher risk than the 30%. So adding one risk factor to this ejection fraction, which could be non-sustained VT, PVCs, increases the risk of sudden death. However, despite now, I would say that I've been studying this for almost three decades. 25 years I've been studying sudden death. I do not think we have better risk marker than ejection fraction. And unfortunately, there is nothing more emerging. We have been talking of MRIs, we have been talking of biomarkers, we have talked of many other things. It is not emerging. But another aspect which is very bad to see is the group which has ejection fraction more than 40%. Now, this group accounts for a lot of sudden deaths. You can see more than half of the victims have ejection fraction, more than 30%. And now you would say, this person has 35% and why should I give an ICD? Because I don't understand. That's why I say, why should I give ICD? But majority of deaths are again happening in higher ejection fraction. So these are some very unknown things. This is what um, Sandeep was discussing about the Danish trial. So the inclusion criteria was heart failure, non-ischemic theology, class 2 to class 3 patients. This included patients who were planned for CRT, ejection fraction less than 35. So objective was to look at the effect of ICD, but the major problem was uh, they did not find a difference. The major problem was the control group got CRTs. Now, if you pollute your group, if you give a CRT to a patient who has left bundle branch lock and more than half of these patients in the control group got a CRT, you are going to modify the ejection fraction. You are going to change that patient. So his value has changed after that CRT. So how do you compare an ICD to a comp controlled population which has received a CRT? So basically it's not a C ICD trial. It is a CRT versus a CRTD trial. So it is something which pollutes our understanding of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So you can see 58% of the patients in both groups got CRT. So if you give in the control group a CRTP and say that the defibrillator did not benefit you have already improved his ejection fraction. You have improved the value. He had left bundle branch block. Now he's better off. He doesn't need an ICD. So this is a discussion which is does not satisfy uh, all this. However, there's a group of several etiologies which have to be looked at, such as sarcoidosis. If I get a patient with sarcoidosis, even if his ejection fraction is 50%, he has PVCs, he has heavy blocks, he gets an ICD irrespective. I recently had a patient with neuromuscular dystrophy. She came with atrial flutter. Her ejection fraction was 45%. After the flutter ablation, we saw that a lot of PVCs were there. This is a high-risk group. They need an ICD. There are some familial cardiomyopathies, the LMNA gene, which will need an ICD irrespective whatever in coronary is being normal. So there is a lot of substrate which we have to understand. So it is not very simple as we discuss. And SCADF trial clearly... Uh, showed a remarkable benefit in non-ischemic and ischemic uh, etiologies of both these. As a result, uh, uh, we were prompted to use a improved SCA trial where we tried to look at more risk factors and uh, we had three groups. So it, it is a non-randomized trial, basically an observational study. Patients were advised to take an ICD but they may or may not have chosen. We found there was a group which was called 1.5 prevention group. This group had low ejection fraction plus one risk marker like PVCs, history of synco, 
uh, in them. So if they had one more risk marker, we found that they behaved exactly like a secondary prevention group. They behave the highest risk group. So if a patient had a non-sustained BT, syncope, or even if his EF was less than 25%, he was in this group. And we found the maximum benefit in this group. And uh, mind it, this was India and China which had contributed the maximum number of patients. We have already got 15 publications of this trial. And uh, uh, clearly, uh, even uh, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy benefited. So we, if you add one more risk factor, which I, in my opinion, is PVC and non-sustained VD, you would be much better off in treating this patient. This was a group comparing non-ischemic versus ischemic in our trial. We found that both got equal benefit. So the next question is, when do you plan an ICD in primary prevention? Guideline recommend three months of optimal medical therapy based on only on expert consensus, nothing else. Rational is that all, all trials have considered three months of optimal medical therapy. Shortcoming is there are some high risk patients, three months may be just too much for them. For example, a post MI patient having non-sustained VTs, low ejection fraction, we don't have the uh, the non-invasive ICDs which uh, are not available in India. What do you do in such groups? This is the biggest shortcoming and you, if you lose them suddenly, you keep regretting that you were finally following the guidelines. So in meta-analysis of the primary prevention trials, clearly ICD in non-ischemic group also benefited equally. So in conclusion, uh, SCD prevention remains a cornerstone in management of non-ischemic and ischemic. Data from Danish should be not be misinterpreted to say ICD is not treated in non ischemic cardiomyopathy. This is a beautiful, elegant uh, diagram from the ESC 2020, uh, 2021 from the ESC heart, line, heart failure guidelines where they put into uh, two things the ejection fraction and QRS duration. So, if ejection fraction is less than 35, QRS 130 milliseconds or less after all these drugs, ICD in non-ischemic is class 2A. So they have downgraded. Earlier, it was 1A. Based on the Danish trial, I think they have jumped a little too faster because we need more data on this. Americans have still stuck to 1A, both in non-ischemic and ischemic. So they have put it at class 2A. If ejection fraction is more than 35% or device therapy not indicated or inappropriate, if symptoms persist, consider other therapies. Now, if patient has sinusism, ejection fraction less than 35, QRS more than 130, CRTD or CRTP, depending on what physician decides, this answer is also not very clear as to what should be. So I just showed you this and one must remember that uh, they have put ICD implantation within 40 days of MI as class 3A indication or patients with class 4 with severe symptoms refractory to pharmacological therapy, putting an ICD is unethical because you will, he doesn't have a survival more than one year. You should consider LVAD or if the patient is a candidate for CRT, you could do a CRTD. Such patients could be a transplant or LVAD candidates, not an ICD candidate. So that is also very clear. Thank you very much uh, for uh, listening to me. And uh, I, I was trying to be as precise and as concise as I could be. Thank you, Dr. Balbi. Very clear messages uh, that ICD is important to save sudden cardiac death, but only in people who have a good life, uh, life survival of more than one year. Uh, you also pointed out about the Danish uh, trial and the uh, uh, questions which have come out of it. But my uh, question back to you is that if even if we are giving CRT or heart failure therapies, and it reduces certain cardiac death and uh, to the extent that it is comparable to the group where certain cardiac death uh, or ICD was given, I would say that uh, giving a good heart failure management or CRT, it improves not only the certain cardiac death, but also the symptoms. And ICD uh, alone is not going to improve the symptomatic status or the ejection fraction for that matter. So it's always important to try to improve the ejection fraction by whatever means. The important other thing which you also said, the controversy still lies, then people who have ejection fraction more than 35 are the larger chunk of people who die suddenly. However, the proportion of people who have less than 35% ejection fraction, they have higher chances of having sudden cardiac death. So very clear messages. 
I would now like to hear Dr. Um, Abraham Oman, because one thing is also true that all these trials on ICD and all those things were before the two new molecules actually came into the market. That means the RNAs and uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. And as you uh, heard from Dr. Hari Krishnan, Dr. Uh, um, Balbir, as well as Dr. Said, that heart failure therapy also reduces the chance of sudden cardiac death. So can we have something on the horizon to improve the outcome, symptomatic outcome, as well as sudden cardiac outcome in uh, patients with heart failure? Dr. Abraham Oman, he will be talk, uh, talking about emerging role of neurotherapies in sudden cardiac death prevention. Thank you, Dr. Mittal. I, I hope I am audible and visible. My topic is emerging role of newer therapies, especially RNAs and SGLT2 inhibitors in sudden cardiac death prevention. I have nothing to declare in relation to this talk. So there are many important questions. Some of them has been answered already. So I would raise the questions and I will try to summarize at the end also. The first question is, what is sudden cardiac death in patients with heart failure? We heard initially that sudden cardiac death is usually occurs in general population. You are priorly asymptomatic, but heart failure patients are not that group at all. They are, they have symptoms, they have symptoms we heard, class two to class four, and we know that they have disease. So they're not general population. So what is sudden cardiac death in heart failure? What is unique about it? It is not the suddenness, it is the unexpectedness. Then next is do drugs like statins, antiplatelets uh, that reduce coronary ischemic events, reduce sudden death, or ventricular tachyarrhythmias, the only mechanisms of sudden death is acute mechanical failure, a mechanism of sudden death. Is it possible to demonstrate that adverse ventricular remodeling per se leads to cascading acute mechanical failure and sudden death? The concept very fashionable and very talked about concept of self-organizing criticality and cascading failure in the remodel ventricle. The role of guideline-directed medical therapy, especially RNAs and SGLT2 inhibitors in preventing sudden death. And finally, the role of ICD in the era of RNAs and SGLT2 inhibitors. So Milton Packer had written a series of articles and which uh, literally reignited the interest of sudden death in heart failure. And uh, this is this latest from a European Heart Journal. I invite everybody to go through that. And his question was, the title was, what causes sudden death in patients with chronic heart failure and a reduced ejection fraction? So we all heard about nearly 50% of the patient with uh, HFREF die suddenly and more in class two and the class four comes, uh, sudden death proportionately reduces. That brings us to a concept of gestalt. So gestalt is an organized whole. It is more than the sum of its parts. And why am I, and this concept is there in paintings and other things. And uh, the why am I bringing paintings and gestalt into this? Because simply speaking, gestalt means more you look, more you see. This is the Van Gogh's Starry Night, one of the most famous Western art. And when I asked my residents, fellows, what is the cause of sudden death? 100 percentage, the answer comes as it is an arrhythmic death. So we have to, more you look, more you see, the concept of just all. It's a paper published in European Heart Journal. And they looked at the, the terminal events and over two years in patients with heart failure. And you can see there are many contributory factors. It is not only arrhythmic deaths. Let's look at NYHA class two, the most studied. There is something like non-cardiovascular death, non-fatal vascular event, sudden vascular death, resistible sudden arrhythmic death, then terminal sudden arrhythmic deaths becomes a lesser proportion, and then condition-related deaths. And as we progress to NYHA four, the condition-related death still remains higher, arrhythmic deaths increases, and non-fatal vascular event also increases. So it is not purely arrhythmia. It's not like when we think of sudden death, 
We always think only about arithmetic events, but the newer concept is that arithmetic events are important as we see here, but think of just start, more you look, more you see. And again, this is supported by another trial or post a CD study published in circulation. They looked at people who had WHO defined sudden cardiac death. This is the entire population, not even heart failure. And they found that only 56% were actually arrhythmic in nature. That means it's just a flip of the coin, 50-50, arrhythmic, non-arrhythmic. So we have to look at arrhythmias, important, very, very important, but also a little beyond that. And this brings us to the concept of self-organizing criticality and cascading failure in the remodel ventricle. What is that? Self-organizing criticality means the ventricular myocardium relies on multiple complex adaptations. The, what are the adaptations do? Because the progressive cardiomyocyte stress and stretch, and it can come to a sudden abrupt end that's called cascading failure, thus leading to acute circulatory collapse, that is sudden death in the absence of a new triggering event. And this cascading effect failure can be electrical or mechanical. As I showed in the previous slide, could be even circulatory failure. And the importance is that if it's a mechanical event, you may have incessant VT, VF, which may not be amenable to ICDs. And these arrhythmic events may be actually an epiphenomenon of mechanical failure. So why am I bringing in all these things? Because of the keyword remodel ventricle. So you have all heard about avalanche. Avalanche is very common in US and Europe. Even in Himalayas is very common. It's a small, very imperceptible event, which will like a snowflake will trigger a catastrophic event like an avalanche. And this slide is from Shanatar, uh, the NEJM, very quoted uh, slide. And over time, sudden cardiac death in heart failure has reduced. And why has it reduced? Because we were better in tackling remotely. And we have to understand that ICDs do not influence the substrate for sudden death. It reduces the arrhythmic event, but it does not do anything for remotely. CRT does. So the, that is something which we have to remember. And there are the hugely dilated remodel class. As far we heard, maybe a contraindication. Class three also the benefit of ICD is relatively less. And uh, so these subsets also the failure may be because it's a mechanical event. And there's a consistent efficacy of neurohormonal antagonists. I'm sorry. So let's look at the drugs which we commonly use in heart failure patients, especially since majority are uh, ischemic. Statins, no benefit in sudden cardiac death. Antiplates, anticoagulants, no benefits. CBG surgery, surprisingly, very marginal benefit, and that too on long-term follow-up, and the study had only 2% on IC. AC inhibitors, 20% reduction in post-infarction LV dysfunction. Beta blockers, 25% decreased risk in post-infarction, and 35 to 45% decreased risk in, decreased risk in HFREF. MRS, 35% reduced risk, but very important, minimal effect, if not on beta blockers. So many a times beta blockers are forgotten or some reason we find not to give that or stop that, but you have to understand this. Nebulizer inhibitors, 20% reduction uh, risk overall and 50% decreased risk in patients with baseline ICD. So these are not competitive, they are complementary. CRT, 50% risk in class two to three patients, but benefit in class four is very less. This is from European Heart Journal last year. ICDs in class two patients, 60 to 70% relative risk reduction, which is huge. Class three patients, it becomes lesser and class four patients becomes even lesser. And the onset of benefit and uh, beta blockers take some time. It takes 60 days to three months for its benefit, mortality and sudden death. So it acts a little slow. And that brings us to Arnie's and this Western Sacubitral. So this is from Paradigm. 20% of the so-called stable patients as defined by no prior heart failure hospitalization in Paradigm HF had a primary event. And 
of the stable patient, death preceded heart failure hospitalization 51% and 60% of these deaths were sudden deaths. So that is something which we have to be very, very aware of. And Dr. Harrison already said in the random heart failure registry, about 48% of the deaths were sudden. And in India, again, this is a famous paper from Rodatar, this uh, uh, subgroup analysis from Paradigm. And ICD use in Asia was quite low. You can see here, less than 10%. In US, it was high, but there were benefits both with ischemic and non-ischemic etiology, more with non-ischemic etiology. And we heard that in uh, ICDs in contradistinction, the benefit was more with ischemic etiology. What in short, what did Western psychopathy do? Reduced uh, in vis-a-vis -vis or in competition with enlapril, reduced cardiovascular death by 20%, resuscitated and non-resuscitated death by 22%, and sudden death in patients with ICD by a whopping 51%. This is something which it, it is not competitive, it is complementary. And that's why paper again showing the same thing, 51% reduction when you combine RNAs with ICD. So what are the mechanisms? So I talked about the, the remodeling and there were so many mechanisms in which uh, the remodeling is affected by RNA, reduces afterload, reduces MR, it's a, it's a study which showed that people who are posted for uh, mitra clip, they improved and uh, MR improved. Even we have a series of patients now, small number, but patients who have been posted for mitra clip and over the period of time, by the time they came prepared, like MR reduced or disappeared and no more mitra clips. Reduce ST2, that is a death molecule. Reduce NT pro BNB, the prognostic molecule. Increase nitric oxide. Reduce cyclic GMP, veracigot equivalent, reduce acute myocardial uh, infarction extension, reduce aldosterone, MMP9, TMP1. All these are markers for collagen and fibrosis. And we all heard that fibrosis and scar is a, is a harbinger for uh, electrical events. Reduce extracellular matrix, reduce hypertrophy, reduce apoptosis. And how does this all contribute to rhythmic effect? You can see here. There is a RAS effect and the Pryson effect, reduce myocyte death, reduce hypertrophy, reduce fibrosis, reduce inflammation. And that is what 81 action and reverse remodeling and inflammation, neprilysin inhibition, increase in cafferins, increase in endorphins, increase bradykinin, all lead to reduction of ventricular uh, uh, VPCs. And it is uh, elegantly shown that they are again a harbinger of events. It was reduced. And, and another paper which I would like to discuss is Peter Martin's paper. And uh, this one, uh, the, the events on the ventricular arrhythmias with Walser and Sacubital. And see here, patients who improved the ejection fraction by more than 5%, the significant reduction in non sustained VT and the PVC burden. So, one marker may be improvement in ejection fraction. And another important thing which I would like to uh, uh, put it across to you is that when they started Valsarin Sacubital, the VPC burden came down. Over time, there was mild increase. But once you go, went to the maximum dose, it became very, very less. So we all know that foundation therapies must be given, start low, go slow. But one thing which is forgotten is that try to apply it to the maximum dose and See here, if you apply it right here, the benefit in even sudden death theoretically may be significant. And third, Alzheimer's and Sacramental article, which I would like to discuss, is Felker's paper in uh, March 2021. And again, I talked about the improvement of ejection fraction. We all know that three months is like cut off by the guidelines, and it is based arbitrarily because trials were held like that. But would ejection fraction improve after that? And this was from PRO-HF. And people who were primary prevention ICD eligible, when they added sacrificial valsartan, the one third, 32% improved the ejection fraction to more than 35% by six months, and 62%, two third by 12 months. So again, like we make in a selected patient, we can think of even increasing this so-called three-month 
uh, cutoffs. But as said, uh, uh, the scare of gay people, would something happen in between? But once they were on Wall Street and military, the initial phases, only 2% had sudden death in six months in paradigm, less than 1% at one year at OHS. So that may show that the variables may not be necessary. We may have some more time. These are the new things. What about SGLT inhibitors? This has been called by Von Wald as the statins of 21st surgery in the latest, latest European Heart Journal. Statins uh, do not reduce uh, uh, sudden death. But then let's look at the two meta-analysis which, which came uh, this year, early th this year. I'll go from the meta-analysis, then I'll go to the study per se. First was the meta-analysis by Fernandez et al. They looked at arrhythmias and sudden death in patients with type 2 diabetes or heart failure. And they found that it reduces atrial arrhythmias and found that may be associated with reduced reduce risk in, of sudden cardiac death in type 2 diabetes. They said adequately powered clinical studies are needed. This is Swaropolos, uh, Swaropolos meta-analysis and uh, it looked at all the studies and a lot of studies and they found that uh, their interpretation was that this meta-analysis was, was not uh, uh, not associated with sudden reduction of sudden death with SGL2 inhibitors or ventricular arrhythmias. But the others said that here, heart failure with reduced death infraction patients were underrepresented and the follow periods were very small. So, and they said we need a new trial. So that leads us to the effect of DAPA glyphosate. This is a DAPA HF trial and uh, it was presented in the ESC and published recently. This is the publication. And if you see this publication, the what is the end or what is the conclusion? Dapagliflozin reduced the risk of any serious ventricular arrhythmias, cardiac arrest or sudden death when added to conventional therapy in patients with FRF. So that is a pretty strong statement, but that is a combination. But we all know that these serious ventricular arrhythmias are harming us for events. So they have to be seen in totality, not in isolation. And look at the effect, there, there is numbers are less, the p-value is significant, but what I gather from this is uh, two or three things. First is that the worm started diverging at around 270 days and it continued to diverge. So that is important. So the effect of SGLT2 inhibitors may be slow, but it is significant and it continues over time. And look at the... Uh, uh, different subgroups. There was no heterogeneity, but what I interesting ischemic, non-ischemic, uh, ejection fraction less than medial, more than medial. Patient with less antiprobin, we had more benefit, and patient with ICD or CRT, patient not on ICD or CRT had more benefit compared to uh, the people who are on that. In contrast, distinction with uh, uh, in the paradigm. What is the summary of DAPA of this sub-study? DAPA compared to placebo reduced the primary events of ventricular arrhythmias, so resuscitated cardiac arrest or sudden death by 21%. It was consistent in a competing risk analysis and it was consistent in various sensitivity analysis and it was consistent across key subgroups. The key word was consistent. Empagliflozin, we don't have similar data, but Empire Heart reduced LV mass, so reverse remodeling, it may be beneficial. And uh, the mechanism in SGLT2 inhibitors may be that there's some benefit on the sodium channel, which acts on the calcium hemostasis, which reduces arrhythmias and improves the systolic and diastolic. And lastly, in the last few minutes, I would like to take something from the Muthu Vadagunathan's famous paper from Lancet and uh, re reverse engineer it. And what is the benefit of foundational therapy, newer therapies, RNA plus beta blockers, plus MRA plus SGLT2 versus AC plus beta blocker? And we all know that. And what is the harm in not doing that? So, so benefit, we know these are all death, the hardest endpoint, majority of death or sudden cardiac death, reduce cardiovascular death, heart failure hospitalization by 62%, cardiovascular death by 50%, or cause mortality by 47%, increased uh, median survival of 6.3 years. But if you do not do so, we just give ACEs plus 
beta blockers versus a choice of R4, we increase cardiovascular death hospitalization by 163%, increase cardiovascular death by 100%, increase all cause mortality risk by 89%. So we have all have taken an oath, primum non nocere, of us do no harm by, in, we may be even not preventing sudden deaths in the patient. And this one, random heart failure registry, don't give uh, guideline directed therapy, mortality increases, and 48% of them were sudden. And now the new concept is uh, door to guideline directed medical therapy time. We are familiar with door to needle, door to balloon, but door to guideline directed medical therapy, faster we initiate, then more likely that these patients are on plan directed therapy. So the important questions, what is sudden cardiac death in patients with heart failure? It is an unexpectedness, not the suddenness. Do drugs like statins and antiplates reduce a sudden death? No. Are ventricular tachyarrhythmias only mechanism of sudden death? No. Is acute mechanical failure a mechanism of sudden death? Yes. Is it possible to demonstrate that adverse ventricular remodeling can lead to cascading failure? Yes. Is the concept of self-organizing criticality and cascading failure the remodel ventricle important? Yes. Role of GDMT, especially RNA in SGLT2 in preventing sudden cardiac death, very important. Role of ICD in the era of RNA and SGLT inhibitors, individualization and implementation. My conclusions are novel medical therapy, CD has reduced. Current stratification strategies have shortcomings. A personalized approach is important. Novel predictors like genetics, biomarkers, EP, fibrosis imaging, ECG markers are important. RCTs are needed, especially in NA, non ischemic cardiomyopathy patients, on top of guideline directed therapy. The newer studies, research CRT, and profit trials may offer new directions. Thank you very much for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Oman. That was a wonderful uh, description of the latest data on the new drugs. Um, I would, uh, before I go to the case, I would like to ask the panel right now, is that do you expect that if we have, uh, in the light of the RNEs and SGLT2 data, that the indications of the ICDs would be revisited uh, in the future? And Dr. Oman, uh, first your comments. And yeah. Then... yeah, so uh, there is a study going on like profit. So what they did was people less than EF35%. There is a subset of people who are at low risk of sudden death, and there is a subset with a high risk. So low risk of sudden death, if you give ICDs, it may be a waste. Similarly, ejection fraction more than 35%, there is a subset with high risk of sudden, sudden death, and a subset with low risk of sudden death. And if you do not give ICDs, or if you deny ICDs, it is again uh, uh, not right. So Profit is looking at multi-marker approach. And as I said before, looking at genetics, the EP, including simple ECGs and uh, the imaging, all these things will give us an idea. Mm -hmm. And as, as you said before, the original ICD trials were all nearly 20 years back. But at that time, the guideline directed medical therapy was a different ballgame altogether. I believe that ICDs are not going to go anywhere. It's going to improve, increase, and we have to implement that. Again, we have to pick up the patients who will benefit maximum with ICDs. Thank you. Dr. Hari, uh, a comment on the fact that why are the ICD uh, usage in the country so low? Any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think uh, we had done a study on the economic impact of uh, acute coronary syndrome uh, some time back. So I have some uh, data from that. In that, around 11% of the patients uh, were not taking any medications because they couldn't afford. That was all. So affordability is a major problem. And also the referral patterns. I think Dr. Amit Bora's group have done a study from Bombay. They found that those patients uh, which they... Uh, found eligible for either an ablation or an or a device was referred and finally what they found was only 17% of the patients actually received it. Um, either they were not uh, they were referred but they did not uh, the patients did not go to the uh, to the uh, to the electrophysiologist or the or for the device for uh, for many reasons. Uh, 
the most important i think is an affordability because uh, these are too too costly the devices are too costly for people to but uh, i think we should stress on the pharmacotherapy which already shows that uh, it gives very significant mortality reduction at least beta blocker uh, gives a significant benefit i think uh, we should stress on the pharmacotherapy uh, in patients uh, in from india at least I think that also brings to a point what Dr. Balbir was mentioning uh, in his discussion that people who are becoming symptomatically better, NYHA class two, you know, a person comes to us with NYHA class three or four heart failure, we give treatment, the person starts feeling better, NYHA class two, and that person actually, although is feeling better, but is at high risk of having sudden cardiac death as compared to when the person was symptomatic. That becomes a paradox that once the person starts feeling better, we say, no, now <clears> the <throat> ICD, as compared to when he was sick enough, when the patient is usually motivated to have a, something or the other to improve his uh, lifespan or life uh, quality. So that also becomes a paradox. What is your take on this, uh, Dr. Seth? Uh, I think I would like to mix a bit of what Dr. Abraham said and along with what Dr. Balbir said. Like most of my patients would not be on an ICD mainly because of, again, affordability. But even then, what uh, we should be and what I also do is that I stratify them. I would be looking at if they've had a syncope and actually like Dr. Balbir said, if they've had multiple ectopics, I would be stressing on going for an ICD. So I look at whether they can afford or they can somehow get to afford ICD, I would strongly recommend ICD, especially if their biomarkers are also very high. I'm finding that if their functional capacity is down and if the biomarkers are high, so if they have a BNP, which is in the range of 1,000 plus or even 2,000, these patients are somewhat more likely to have a sudden death in the future. Biomarkers, I still believe, have a role, even though studies are not very strong in that. MRI, of course... There are studies, but they have not gone beyond studies. Genetics also has not gone beyond studies. They're not come strongly into guidelines. So simple things like VPC burden, a simple halter, which showing NSVT, and a very high biomarkers and functional capacity, which may be going down slightly, but there's still NYHA2, borderline NYHA3. These are patients where you should think of an ICD. But yes, you need to revisit the studies because these studies are actually very old. And see, if in, in probably we have to work from India, we should collect our own data when we're not going to follow the guidelines from the West anyway. Most of the patients, we're not going to give ICDs anyway. We should generate our own guidelines. This is, this is one group where we should generate our own guidelines, especially when you're not going to follow. We're following the medical guidelines. We're not following the ICD guidelines anyway. So this is a group where we should follow the guidelines, create our own guidelines. Yeah, one uh, question to Dr. Sandeep, uh, because ST2 is a marker of fibrosis and uh, we know that fibrosis is a marker of scarring and uh, that leads to, so is there, are there any data on uh, ST2 levels and uh, sudden death, any data? Yeah, we are doing an ongoing study with acute heart failure. We're trying to look at markers for uh, uh, subsequent death and ST2 is not standing out at all as a marker, whereas simple NT Pro BNP does seem to be, <clears throat> be useful along with other markers. So even NT Pro BNP alone is not standing out as a marker of uh, subsequent death because the patients that we are enrolling are anyway all patients with acute decompensated heart failure. So we're not taking stable patients, we're taking only sick patients. So who are already class three, four. So in that ST2 has absolutely no role. NT Pro BNP combined with some clinical markers and LFT, RFT, and a whole lot of other markers does seem to still have a role, but ST2 doesn't seem to have any role at all. So it is there maybe in a full range of heart failure where stable, unstable patients are there. But if you start with a group of patients who are already very sick, in that it doesn't seem to really play much of a role, at least not in the study that we are doing currently. <clears throat> One question, uh, I think uh, I just would like to um, confuse a little bit more. You know, Dr. Abraham uh, did show in his slides, especially the DATPA HF uh, trial and most of the other trials as well, those who had anti-pro BNP level less or towards the lesser unit, they were actually benefited more by the ICD implantation. 
Uh, is that true, Dr. Uh, Oman? So what I showed was the DAPA HF and more than median and less than median. And DAPA HF, I think it was somewhere uh, mm -hmm. near uh, early thousands. So basically, when NT protein being increased, they are much more symptomatic. They become class three, class four. And again, we know that class three, class four patients uh, mm -hmm. are, they have more mechanical reasons of sudden death. So when we, the, the concept that all sudden deaths are purely electrical uh, are, is not true, especially in class three and class four. So we had to pick and choose and people with very, very enlarged hearts, sky high, 10,000, 25,000, they still benefit, but the class two patients with uh, uh, like Dr. Sandeep said, around uh, mm -hmm. thousand-ish kind of people are the persons I believe uh, would benefit more. And that's what the data shows. Okay. Dr. So, Chopra, what, mm -hmm. what do you think would be the mechanisms of benefit of the SGLT2 inhibitors? You know, you were the uh, principal and the uh, national lead investigators for this thing. And uh, what is the, uh, what is in your opinion, the reason why SGLT2 inhibitors would be so much benefiting in uh, certain yeah. cardiac deaths? Sanjay, before I answer that question, I'll uh, you know, join in the discussion which was being held. Uh, both Paradigm and DAPA-HF showed similar results in terms of NYHA. So it is not that people who are in NYHA class 2 are more prone to sudden death. It's not so. It is that if they have to die, they are going to die of arrhythmic death. Class 3 and 4, people are going to die of mechanical pump failure. So that person will never come back to you because the mechanism of death in these people is uh, a sudden cardiac death. And that is what was being stressed both by Sandeep and by Abraham, that good pharmacotherapy is extremely important in this. And one new thing I learned from Abraham's talk was that if a person is not on beta blockers, then uh, aldosterone antagonist may not be that beneficial. I mean, that was news to me. Now, as far as the mechanism is concerned, you know very well that the mechanisms of SGLT2 inhibitors are still being worked out. The mechanistic studies available, whereby it has been shown that uh, on MRI, the interstitium uh, gets, the volume of interstitium decreases. Uh, the uh, uh, total um, interstitial mass if it is increased, it has got a strong arrhythmic effect. That is one thing. There are uh, uh, sodium channels which are involved and there's a whole, whole lot of other mechanisms. On MRI studies, on echo studies, it has been demonstrated. If your left atrial pressures come down and pulmonary artery pressures come down, that also is going to uh, contribute at least in some way to reduction in death, also possibly in sudden cardiac death. So I don't think the mechanism is not yet elucidated. But so long as it works, we are happy. One thing uh, I would like to ask Dr. Om before I go to my uh, <clears throat> short case presentation. You did say that uh, the anti-arrhythmic effect or the sudden cardiac death prevention effect of beta blockers takes about 60 days to come. And uh, I mean, that is something uh, which in our clinical practice though, if a person has ventricular arrhythmias in the ICU or clinic, we are, we are jumping on to give beta blockers to prevent or to subside the ventricular arrhythmias and we see the effects. Even amadron for that matter, if we leave the amadron aside, beta blockers are the drug we use to actually sub, uh, suppress the ventricular arrhythmias. And it was, uh, can you elucidate why it should happen that the sudden cardiac death actually takes 60 days to uh, settle down? Yeah, that is because the, see the, when you, uh, see a large population of patients, the people with multiple VPCs, they are not that high because these studies, the mm -hmm. people with uh, non-sustained VTs or huge PVC burden are not that high. The huge majority of the patients still have relatively fine, you do a halter, they look fine and then they die suddenly. So these are the subgroups, two subgroups which I personally believe will get early benefit is the people with ICD is the people with syncope because the audience should understand that syncope is an ominous symptom and the VPC burden is very high. So, but the huge, the population, the number of patient number when it comes 
the 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 curves may start diverging that may be because of the people with early higher number of pvcs but then it really starts diverging at 60 to 90 days because it reduces the sudden death in the other people also so this is where the individualization comes and i i totally agree with you people with multiple vpcs it acts quickly and it, uh, uh, it reduces so such people no person should be without beta blockers and uh, but like uh, on the when you see the bigger picture no person should be without the four foundational therapy from guideline direct medical therapy maybe part of it is due to reverse remodeling also which will take Absolutely. time and we know that beta blockers have a very strong effect on reverse remodeling uh, one uh, question to dr oman uh, see uh, the now uh, we are talking about the maximum uh, the the target doses uh, but uh, now we are also discussing about the maximum tolerated doses so is there any data on that because uh, many of our patients you know, cannot uh, reach 200 mm -hmm. mg bd of army uh, 200 mg of metoprolol many of them have many uh, many issues because uh, when we see the, the the data from the asian heart uh, failure registry the the patients who, re who are reaching targets are only 17% or 20% uh, so what is your any any specific data on that maximum tolerated dose uh, how much it will prevent uh, the sudden death so that should be yeah. our aim yeah i totally agree with you the the aim should be to have the guy all four drugs at the maximum the guideline directed dose but it is uh, still a mirage because in <clears throat> jam registry less than 1% had guideline directed dose of all three but having said that uh, we should try to reach the the tolerate tolerance is mostly or good amount is because the creatinine goes up little bit from 1.3 if it goes to 1.4 or 1.5 then we take a step back if the bp is 95 patient may so that kind of inertia has to be removed other than that it is maximum tolerated dose but here both the doctor has to make an absolute effort because if you do not make that effort we will be at that level and having said that the peter martin's just, uh, paper uh, some of them were not at 200 bd of Valsartan cyclobutyl, and uh, and they also got benefit. So benefit is there even with the smaller doses. But what we forget is that we have to uh, reinforce that we should make all efforts to titrate it upwards. And there is uh, uh, again there is some uh, some data from Biostat or something from Asian study where they tried which one to up titrate first and uh, to the maximum dose, and they found but titrate AC inhibitors higher. But having said that, uh, all four foundational drugs and slowly titrate upwards. But we should make that effort. Mm -hmm. That is the message. If we go back a little bit to paradigm trial, there again, uh, we found that the reduction in sudden cardiac death was maximum in patients with in NYHA class two. And there again, if they compared patients who were not on full doses, on, max, on maximum doses, their dose for dose, the improvement with ARNI was more than with enalapril. So, including sudden cardiac death. So, um, of course, uh, we should make an honest attempt to try and reach the maximum dose. But even if you cannot, for some reasons, blood pressure or whatever, even then, maximally tolerated dose will give benefit. Yeah. So, I'll quickly go to the case. It's a short case. Mm -hmm. And then we'll have discussions on the practical aspects of uh, the arrhythmia management. So this case uh, is uh, I'm going to discuss about today is a case of Mr. RB, 70 years age, presented to cardiac OPD on 16th September, breathlessness on exertion by check class three, along with weakness and fatigability for eight months, diabetic for 20 years, was normal tensile always, he had chest pain with left ventricular failure in 2021. And that time he had uh, been diagnosed to have an ST elevation myocardial infarction. Angiogram done during that time showed triple vessel disease with the left main disease in February 2021. And he sat in that much duration of eight months just to come here, probably because of COVID or whatever. 
He had previous history of left ventricular failure in 2012, which was medically managed. His comorbidities were that he had long-standing diabetes, his CKD with a creatinine level of 2.1 milligrams and estimated GFR was 33 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square, and also had anemia, hemoglobin of 9.7 gram per dl, which was microcytic and hypochromic. The ECG showed right bundle branch block, QR duration was 135 milliseconds. Echo showed uh, akinetic apex uh, with ejection fraction of just 20%. There was two by four mitral regurgitation and uh, severe low pressure TR two weeks back. He was put on decongestive therapy at that time and uh, was subjected to a PET scan outside uh, the hospital, which showed uh, that there was a perfusion defect of as much as 40%, out of which 5% was infarction and large 35% area was hibernating. This is the ECG. You can see that is, there is right bundle branch block and left atrial overload and a little tachycardia, a QRS situation as I was mentioning. Angiogram, you can see the right coronary artery, the diffuse diseases, tight right coronary artery disease, left main along with tight uh, circumflex OM here and also a tight LED. But targets were available. The PET scan did show a, a refilling uh, of our uh, metabolism here in the inferior wall, in the septal area, in the septal area again, and a large chunk of the anterior wall. So this was something which actually promoted that there was ischemia ongoing. And uh, we had a bad situation because ejection fraction was just 20% and all those things. He was still NYC class 3, eject BP was okay, pulse rate was settled venous pressure, JVP was elevated. However, the pedal edema had settled down um, on 16th of September, that is a week, uh, two weeks after uh, the decongestion was started. There was no hepatomegaly, basal crackles were there. Creatinine was still 2.1 milligram per DL. Potassium was normal. Hemoglobin was low. Um, medications, he was on carvedilol, uh, CR, uh, 10 milligrams, ivabradine, torsamide, spironolactone, nitrates, atorvastatin, aspirin, and antidiabetics, uh, uh, which was uh, zorid, uh, and that is uh, uh, metformin and uh, uh, sulfonylureas. So our strategy was that we had to plan and prepare him for bypass surgery, but he was not considered fit because the Euro score was as high as 20 to 25 percent. And mind it, in Indian population, it would be higher than this percent risk of operative mortality. The cardiac team actually uh, surprised that we should stabilize the person. And we have been doing a, a external counter pulse in such patients to stabilize the heart uh, function and renal function, and then do the bypass surgery with a lesser risk. Um, we added nicorandal, trametazidine, and also added dapagliflozin, considering that this is going to add uh, all three values, the heart failure, the di and diabetic control, as well as uh, the uh, renal function. After five days of uh, counterpulsation, he did feel well. Uh, he lost, lost two kgs, NYH class two. There was unfortunately a dizziness spell in the morning and he was advised to have a holter. And in the holter, what we found was 13,000 ventricular ectopics that was amounting for nearly 14% of ectopic burden. And uh, there were multiple NSVT episodes. There are two different morphologies here. Uh, you could see those two morphologies and that is what was uh, us deciding that this person should be admitted for stabilization and possibly um, uh, understand why this thing is happening. Maybe the potassium was uh, uh, going haywire, whatever, and then plan for a different strategy. How, uh, however, within a day, he delayed the admission for a day, but uh, when he had a sustained ventricular tachycardia, Although hemodynamic stable because the blood pressure was still 90 systolic, he was admitted to the emergency. At that time, the hemoglobin was slightly better. The creatinine had increased. The anti-proBNP had increased because he was in sustained ventricular tachycardia for a few hours. And there was also deterioration of SGOT and SGPT. The question was what to do at that time because there was no uh, markers of cardiac injury uh, positivity there. And X-ray was showing a little bit of congestion Eco ejection fraction did show almost 20-25% only at that time. Um, and the mitral regurgitation 
was just trace at that point in time and with elevated filling pressures. So what we confided was at this time, we should put him on intraortic balloon pump. And that was put on on 24th of September. His hemodynamics did settle, uh, renal function settled in two, three days time. And after that, we did a bypass surgery on him. Uh, two grain, vein grafts were given, the right ventricular, uh, right coronary artery could not be traced and it was all diffused the disease and occluded. Minded the angiogram was then almost six months back and a venous graft to LED and OM were given. The person was extubated on 28th September, IAVP was removed on 30th September. And on fifth post-operative day, he again developed a hemodynamic stable ventricular tachycardia. The blood pressure was maintained, but he had this ventricular tachycardia. The creatinine at that time was 1.7 and all uh, the um, uh, electrolytes were okay. And this is the ventricular tachycardia ECG. You can see uh, that this is possibly endocardial uh, origin. So the question here was, should we go uh, for just pharmacological management? Because they, the guidelines did not actually put this into a primary uh, prevention um, category. The person did improve with medications, but uh, the question was to do an ICD or not. Um, so uh, we decided to increase the beta blockers. We added amiodarone to stabilize the ventricular tachycardia. Advised to have an ICD, uh, dual chamber ICD was implanted on 4th of October. The person was discharged on 7th of October and is still doing well on 1st of November, 2021. And this is the latest echocardiogram, uh, which we have done just a few days back, um, just prior to Diwali. And you can see the ejection is marginally better. The heart size is marginally better, although the filling pressure are still high, but he has been walking two to three kilometers a day now. And we had increased the dapagliflozin also in this particular patient, and he's doing pretty, particularly well. We have not started uh, the ARNIs as of now because the creatinine is still high, and we are just waiting for uh, him to uh, show a little stabilization for the next two, three weeks, and then possibly think about starting the ARNIs. So that is uh, the case. I'll stop here, uh, invite questions. Uh, the biggest question in front of us was, could we have done something else? Should we, done, should we do an ICD in this case? This is not a primary prevention because he didn't have syncope by that definition. But would we put this still into a secondary prevention or a primary prevention? I think ICD is uh, very much indicated. I don't think there is any point of discussion on that because once he's had a sustained VT, he had one before the surgery, he's had one after the surgery. So it would be a matter of time before he has a fully sustained VT and he has a, has a synco. So I don't think there is much of discussion as far as the indication of a ICD is concerned. That probably would be indicated. Probably in terms of medical therapy, I would like to add that uh, he would war his blood pressure from what you mentioned is above 100. And his creatinine is not very high. I mean, I think Dr. Chopra would also agree that he could benefit from some <clears throat> amount of either ACE inhibitors or a combination of hydrolyzine nitrate till his function starts improving and he can go on to uh, ARNI. So that much at least he will benefit from ICD. I think there is no doubt from myself. So when we saw the pressure of 109 on uh, um, the last day of observation, we escalated the dose of beta blockers to the maximum dose. He is on uh, 100 milligrams of metoprolol um, in the morning and 50 milligrams in the evening right now. But you know, Sandeep has been doing 25 milligram twice a day of ARNI successfully in the past in these patients. And then uh, many times what you find is that in course of few days, as the left ventricle uh, undergoes reverse remodeling, the pressures actually start coming up. So I would, when the patient is in hospital, nowadays we have data for pre-discharge also, I would probably consider adding a very, very small dose of ARNI and checking BP before each dose. The person is in the hospital, maybe you can do that. Right. Uh, can I have a comment here? Yes. Yeah. It, okay. So, first about the appropriateness of guidelines. The EC guidelines say that ICD for 
EF less than 35% and QRS less than 130, then there is an addition and where appropriate. And I would feel that this particular case is where appropriate also will, will come into play. So I would I feel that ICD is appropriate. Secondly, we all uh, attribute beta blockers less VPCs, but as I showed in that uh, Peter Martin's paper, uh, armies are also VPC reducing. Uh, armies are also because, and they started reducing in very fast, within a month. So I would give, because AC versus Arnie in this particular patient, I would carefully give Arnie and but bit carefully, and I would like the biggest problem is when we refer to nephrologists, they may say the creatinine is increasing, but I'll keep a watch on the potassium. But I would also, because I believe that uh, Arnie is also, and there is data for that, the army also reduces non sustained VTs and VPC burden, and that too quickly. What about the uh, electrophysiological evaluation and uh, 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 targeting the v uh, the scar uh, induced ventricular tachycardia? Because it's always always a question when we have an ischemic setting whether the VT is coming from a scar mm -hmm. or VT is coming from an ischemic area. So that is one of the things why we do the revascularization and then only um, um, uh, do for the. Sanjay, here you had nearly thirty five percent of the myocardium which was showing reversible ischemia. So I think there is a very good chance that given another month or two months or three months, the ejection fraction may improve significantly. So I don't think right now there is any indication for going for VT ablation or something like that. And moreover, you have not found any shocks being given so far. Hmm. So VT ablation would come in if a person is getting repeated shocks, if EF has not improved, and then possibly an MR to see how much is the scar burden and then one can evaluate on that. So, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Another, uh, another uh, thing is whether uh, the looking at viability. So, in this patient who had an ejection fraction of 20%, so do we routinely look for viability? Uh, that is a, a point because uh, the stitch trial at 10 year follow up also did not show any uh, benefit in looking at the viability. But probably we have to individualize the cases and see. Uh, because here there is a significant residual ischemia, uh, ischemia around 35%, which definitely, and the vessels are uh, really good graftable vessels also. Targets mm -hmm. are really good. So in that case, I think probably we should err on the side of uh, revascularization rather than um, waiting for the results of... Uh, hmm. So I have two questions here in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Gurdeep Sethi, he is uh, asking what's the role of SAECG, T wave alterance and heart rate variability in prediction of sudden cardiac death. Uh, Dr. Oman? Yeah, as I said before, Ed, like uh, these are all important predictors, but we don't have randomized trials there. That is the biggest problem. So we should, medicine is an art and we should utilize everything. And uh, that is why I mentioned profit trial. They are trying to introduce not even that, even the, the ECG morphology itself may give us a clue. So we should have look at a multi risk factor approach. But again, do we have a randomized trial? We do not have. So all these are markers to individualize and implement the guidelines. That was that would that the way I would look at it. Dr. Hari, Dr. Chopra, and others. Dr. Uh, Babi did discuss about this uh, SCA study he was talking about, and I, I was uh, we were partner to that. Uh, so there were uh, to define one and a half uh, risk of uh, instead of uh, grade one, class one or class two, one and a half. It was basically presence of uh, frequent VPCs, uh, RNT couplets, or NSVTs. If they were there, or, uh, then it was suggested that they are high risk of having certain cardiac death and they were included uh, uh, or given an option of an ICD or otherwise. Um, but not um, uh, the SAECG and the T-wave alternates. That was not actually just, and you are absolutely right, Dr. Oman, that um, the, uh, the, the, the data is not in favor of giving an ICD on the basis of these uh, observations. Dr. Harik, you were saying something. 
do we really recommend a, 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 a 24 hour halter for all these patients um, so should it come and whether uh, the, the 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 findings in that halter if it is negative uh, what what is a, what is your comment dr woman so we uh, or we should uh, if we don't find anything we should go for a extended halter my approach is simple first thing i will ask is whether the patient is affordable and luckily i practice in a milieu where many are affordable but still it is the the time we spend with the patient which is uh, important for convincing them but uh, halter is important because it is easy to convince ourselves and convince the patients that something is happening so we need to do urgently but my approach would be say if the if they are on guideline directed therapy I may wait for a little more time. I'm more confident after the OHF uh, data that uh, I would wait for six months. I would wait for a little more time to uh, see whether the EF is improving. If the ejection fraction is improving, that is one subset where I would slow down. If the ejection fraction is not improving and they are still two to three and the pressures are still high, they have other parameters and especially syncope, that's one history I keep. Sometimes patients may not tell us, but then we keep on asking and that will accelerate. So I will try to personalize my patients because sometimes it's very difficult even to convince affordable people, reimbursable people for that. And uh, Halter, what I found is that personally, it is not very scientific, but then if you have multiple VPs, not the same VT, our maybe the urgency and the patients also understand. And I was able to convince the majority of them. I routinely do halter, but halter is not the thing which drives me all the time. So halter possibly would help in motivating if there is a positive halter, but if it is negative halter, it cannot rule out the possibility of sudden cardiac death. And that's why it's not included into the guidelines. Absolutely. Right? So there is another question, and that is precisely what uh, the matter of, uh, uh, or the reason for presenting this case was. And Dr. Aditya Verma, he's asking, ICD is not advised for 90 days within bypass surgery. Should we wait 90 days uh, to put an ICD or even second, for even secondary prevention? That is the question. So in this gentleman, uh, just like we had a 20, 25% ejection, 20% ejection fraction, NSVTs, VTs again and again, which was, although not uh, amounting to syncope, but was leading to imp in, uh, impact on the renal function and the liver function in the first place. So that is the purpose. And he had this VT again after uh, the bypass also. That's why the reason mm -hmm. to argue and to uh, discuss out with the family and give it, give the ICD to this gentleman. But uh, your opinion, Dr. Hari, on this and, uh, and the rest of the panelists on this question. I think we should wait for uh, at least few weeks uh, after the bypass surgery or any revascularization to have the effect on the myocardium. Um, I think that is a, a good question and a good suggestion. I think we should wait for at least four to six weeks to, um, uh, to, to see whether there is any effect on the you know, myocardium, which can prevent a sudden cardiac death and an implantation of an ICD, which has its own problems both economically and also uh, as, a, as a procedure. So, but my question, the counter question is, the person is educated person. He knows that he had an NSBT or ventricular tachycardia which was sustained, although not amounting to syncope and had the same thing after the uh, uh, bypass surgery. He can afford the device. So if suppose he goes home, mm -hmm. has a ventricular tachycardia, which can deteriorate to a ventricular fibrillation and he collapses, then what? So it should be left on the uh, patient. In my opinion, the option should be given to the patient that this is the risk, although it, there is a chance of improvement, but we cannot predict uh, what is going to happen after you go home. So let us exactly. I think I think we should individualize and we should discuss with the patient and uh, reach a, 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 an opinion which is acceptable to the patient also. See, I think clinical scenarios are very important. If a person has EF of say 30% or 25%, no significant arrhythmias that you see. 
and you expect a good improvement, then I think we should wait. But if a person is getting VT again and again, and it is, as you showed, it was a significant uh, duration of VT, the next episode may kill that person. So here, as Sandeep said, I don't think there was too much of a difficulty in deciding. The issue will come if somebody has an EF of 25% and you have revascularized, there's no evidence of any significant arrhythmias. There, I think, as Hari is saying, you should wait. I think right. even if, if you recall that PET image which Sanjay showed in the big thing, there was actually a large scar area. And if even if you see the echo post-surgery, <clears throat> the anterior wall is really not contracting much. So whatever improvement you expect post-surgery, it will not make the EF jump from 20% to 40%. So even if you wait for one month, two months, three months, his EF will remain less than 35%. And as Sanjay said, he's, he's had two warnings. He's had two sustained ventricular tachycardias, one before <coughs> surgery, one after surgery. I don't think we need more warnings to put an ICD and the Dr. Balbir is not there. You can't expect to get more warnings for a ventricular tachycardia and the next week you might just kill him. I think all of us have actually lost patients like this where we delayed pushing a patient towards the ICD. I recall many patients where I advised the ICD patient was on the border fence, on the fence and saying, okay, no, let me think about it. And I also because the indications were there, but patient was not very sure, patient was class two, otherwise doing quite well. I didn't insist, I didn't push. Next day I'm phoned after maybe a few weeks or months, patient is dead. So there also I thought maybe I should have actually pushed, patient could have afforded, who was doing otherwise. So maybe see, we, once we've got enough warnings, we should be very clear that we should put ICDs. Right. Yeah, I echo that. And one more thing is just three months actually came from the trials, which is taken kind of arbitrarily. So we like to look at the, all the factors. And that is again, what profit is the, you look at person is very high risk or low risk. And this particular person I thought was quite high risk. And uh, I also would have had discussion with the patient with their informed consent, I would push for uh, ICD. And that would be my approach. Great. What about the what about the uh, use of uh, MRI scar burden uh, in assessing such patients? Uh, Sandeep, any thoughts? Because they say that fifteen percent or more scar burden is a, is high risk and a patient uh, is a high risk for mortality. So, here already uh, MRI. Ha uh, sorry, here already a PET scan has been PET done. Scan has been so we already have this a patient, patient generally. Generally, uh, I'm asking. So, so MRI would be useful maybe in DCM patients looking for fibrosis. There, it would be useful as an added uh, parameter, especially if the ejection fraction is borderline, it's 35 percent, or even better than 35. So, if it's better than 35 percent, maybe 40 percent, 45 percent, then yes. It, it might be as an added parameter, but they have still not added it to any of the guidelines because these are just isolated studies, maybe one, two, three studies which have been done where it has been found to be useful as an indicator. These are all, all single, single studies which are done, like same with MIBG that uh, you, if the MIBG is abnormal, if the adrenergic receptors are reduced then it's an indicator that long term the patient may have uh, more incidence of SCD but again that particular center shows that this is abnormal but other centers don't find it so so none of them are actually entering guidelines as such even I have a patient who's actually a practicing psychiatrist father had a SCD at the age of 50 he, he had a EF initially for which was actually around 40% and he's otherwise doing everything, running around, even though I tell him not to run. I did his MRI. MRI showed extensive enhancement. I told him, look, you should have an ICD as per the guideline because you have extensive enhancement. He said, I would prefer not to right now. And then I, I put him on very high doses of ACE inhibitors and then switched to ARNI and, and very high dose of beta blockers also. His last TF after two is actually, actually become 50%. And he's absolutely asymptomatic. So, so we don't know what's going to happen, but ultimately, some things can go beyond guidelines. I have followed the guidelines. I advised ICD, but he's doing quite well. 
I think there's a trial going on on the MRI uh, the SCAR, uh, device SCAR and uh, ICD. Possibly we'll have to wait for that trial result to come and uh, if it is positive, it may come into the guidelines. But the problem of availability of MRI and the expertise to uh, to read the MRI and interpret it, uh, that is also very, very important. Because in, in correct, India, correct. You know, because we are planning a study on uh, this MRI. We found uh, very few centers uh, across India does that and uh, that is another issue. Absolutely. I think we are already crossed the time limit. Um, um, it was a very knowledgeable session hearing all of the stalwarts on the matter of sudden cardiac death, which is so very important for heart failure patients. And I learned a lot and I think uh, I hope that uh, the audience must also have learned a lot on this. Um, I thank you all. Uh, thank you all for joining. And back to the sponsors, Estra. Thank you, sir. I would first like to thank Dr. Sanjay Mittal for moderating the session so well. And of course, as sir mentioned, the session was very uh, useful and we learned a lot. Uh, I would like to thank Dr. V.K. Chopra, Dr. Sandeep Seth, Dr. Abraham Oman, Dr. Hari Krishnan, and also Dr. Palbir Singh for taking us through this informative session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Good night. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night. Good night.